Okay, good afternoon. Um, I Looking through the audience, it looks like I worked with many of you, if not most of you. Um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, ultrasound physics, and you may say, well, why is this relevant to me? Um, so let me take a few moments to explain. Uh, for the last few years, the critical care societies in the United States have been making a move toward teaching what we're calling focused ultrasound for people who take care of critically ill patients. And that mostly uh, falls to people like myself who are intensivists uh, working in intensive care units. Uh, obviously, the cardiologists already have a lot of training with this for their ICUs. But this is something that we, uh, the critical care uh, uh, faculty in the United States, have been charged with teaching our fellows. Our fellows are now going to their critical care boards and having to interpret uh, basic ultrasound. Okay. So in a response to that, we in the pulmonary division here have started a ultrasound teaching course uh, that uh, we actually started out with the residents, and some of you in the room may have attended some of the courses that we've done. I, I actually started this last spring with a, with a lecture pretty similar to this one uh, that you're going to hear today, followed up by uh, scanning sessions where we would go over to the simulation lab and scan uh, live people. Okay, so people that uh, trainees could get their hands on the ultrasound probe and learn how to use it. And then our next step that we're implementing next month is actually going to start ICU rounds once, a, uh, once every other month so that we actually go in and scan patients who have actual pathology. Okay, so I, at this point, let me invite you, those of you who would like to perhaps acquire these skills, you're you're welcome to come with the ICU teams, which will consist of an attending and our fellows on our ICU rounds. Uh, so if any of you are interested in, in getting up to speed a little bit more on this, you're, you're welcome to attend. But this is where we're moving uh, with this sort of teaching uh, challenge. So uh, the course is being run, and again, let me I'm, I'm talking mainly about uh, what we're going to do with the fellows and the house staff that are interested by myself with assistance from Dr. Cavalazzi and Dr. Saad, I think most of you know them. Uh, Patton Thompson, who's one of our senior fellows, uh, who's very interested in ultrasonography and actually doing his clinical research with an ultrasound project. And then a representative from Sonocyte, uh, who is very, very keen on providing educational material. Now let me take a moment to say that you'll notice that a lot of my educational slides are from Sonocyte, again, because they have folks that are very uh, involved in going to universities and help teaching. We are by no means condoning only Sonocyte equipment. We are not endorsing them in any way. I mean, Philips and GE make great uh, pieces of equipment, so don't get the idea that we're pushing Sonocyte, but uh, this person here has been very helpful with us putting on courses. And occasionally we have guest lecturers in from other institutions uh, to come and talk about ultrasound. So the purpose of the course that we are putting on uh, is to teach proper utilization of focused ultrasound techniques in order to assist in quickly evaluating critically ill patients. Um, when this first came to me as something I really needed to learn, I was working in the ICU one Saturday morning, and I had a 22-year-old girl who got transferred into me from uh, the bone marrow unit who was in shock. It was clear that she was in shock. Uh, but she, had, she was leukopenic, uh, but she had also received a lot of chemotherapy that was cardiotoxic. So we weren't sure if she was in septic shock, distributive shock, or whether she was in cardiogenic shock. We ordered a stat echo. It took me nine hours to get the cardiology fellow uh, to come and do an echocardiogram, okay, to help me decide how to manage this patient. When you're dealing with somebody who's critically ill, nine hours is too long. So, again, and this has been the experience throughout the United States. That That's why we're now teaching intensivists how to do certain focused ultrasound examinations, not just cardiac, but other, the chest, the, the lung, and upper abdomen as well. So how we're running this course, we're doing it, we uh, introduce our fellows and you today to the physics of ultrasound so you understand how uh, the machine works and actually what we call knobology, how the equipment works. The other session I already alluded to, we're doing screening sessions of live models where we do uh, two-dimensional echocardiography, uh, thoracic uh, scanning, and vascular scanning. Now, many of you are already using ultrasound for placement of your central lines, and that's only one part of what we're now teaching. 
Uh, and then pathology, which is the part that we are now also starting with our fellows. We're actually um, collecting video clips from ultrasound exams that we've done that have shown pathology that we sit down and we quiz our fellows on, you know, go through the clips with the fellows so they understand what they're looking at. And then ultimately we'll be doing those rounds in the ICU that I talked about. So the course that we're putting on for our fellows, and again, for you should you be interested, is uh, a basic skills for independently conducting and interpreting limited ultrasound examinations. Okay, Now that's a key word, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, is limited. We're also providing a basis for developing competency in various focused ultrasound techniques. Now, when I say competency, competency, as many of you may know, is a declaration by someone who's your supervisor or mentor saying that somebody has done so many right heart casts or so many left heart casts or so many ultrasounds and in our opinion as educators you are competent to perform this procedure independently. Okay, When you take that information and go to an outside hospital or hospital system and you want to be credentialed then a credentialing board will look at your experience and decide whether or not they will credential you in that procedure. Okay, So just because you have done 100 procedures and feel competent and somebody has a letter, it doesn't necessarily follow that any hospital system will necessarily credential you uh, in that procedure. Okay, Most of the time it happens. If you train in pulmonary critical care medicine, you say, I'd like to do bronchoscopies, they're going to credential you for doing bronchoscopies. That's usually... Uh, uh, it follows. But it is not an absolute. So if you take this course, you may indeed get a letter from us that says you've done this, we've watched you do this, we feel you're competent. But whether you ever actually get credentialed is a matter for your independent hospital credentialing board. Just so you understand, there is a difference between competency and credentialing. What this course will not provide you is we are not planning on making you an expert in ultrasonography. We are teaching you the basics so that you can do pick up the big things at the bedside in the middle of the night without waiting for that um, uh, cardiac fellow to come in nine hours later and do your echocardiogram. It is not intended to supplant the need for formal examinations by radiology and cardiology. I frequently, if I have to do a bedside echocardiogram, to look at LV function or to rule out a pericardial effusion, I do that and then act on the information I get, but then I routinely say, well, let's get a formal echo first thing in the morning, you know, when cardiology gets here. So what we're going to do today, the lecture for today, is simply the first part of this series. And what we're going to do is discuss uh, the ultrasound uh, machine and the physics. So we're going to talk about ultrasound wave creation, how to choose the appropriate transducers. All of you have seen the probes of these, where there are different types of probes, and they're used for different types of examinations, depending on what you're looking for. Factors that affect the ultrasound image, uh, techniques for optimizing your image, and uh, review the different types of imaging modes, such as 2D and M mode and pulse wave Doppler. Why is this important? Well, as you learn this, you will understand that your ability to um, acquire and properly interpret ultrasound images is really almost entirely uh, dependent upon the operator. So if it's like anything else. Um, if you're doing bronchoscopies or right heart casts or left heart casts, you're going to be better at it if you do a 1,000 than if you do just 10. Okay, So it's a matter of, of experience. But... The things that the, um, in the, the operator has to actually get comfortable with is what transducers or probes to use and the proper settings on the machine to get the images that they want. And we will discuss these, gain settings, depth settings, settings, uh, the different echo characteristics of different types of issues, and what artifacts to be on the lookout for. Because artifacts can help you, they can also hinder you. So what is it that ultrasound machines basically do? Well, they're pretty simple. They basically convert, convert energy from one form to another. The machine is plugged into the wall, so there's electrical energy that gets converted to mechanical energy by the probe. The probe sends out an ultrasound wave into the tissue that you are examining. There are echoes that come back from the tissue, and those echoes are collected again by the probe and, revert, and converted back into electrical en uh, energy for display on the screen. 
Very simple in concept. These are the transducers or probes that you might routinely see. I think in our medical ICU here we have two of these probes. Um, where I trained, uh, we actually kept all three of these, but there are others. What we call a linear probe, and these, are, these names are all given based on what we call the footprint of the probe. That is, you can see here, the linear probe is very straight. The curvilinear probe is, as its name, the, the part that you put against the patient, what we call the footprint, is curved. And then the phased array is basically a, a square. And each one of these is used for different types of examinations. Why are they used for different types of examinations? Because they work at different frequencies. And you'll, be, you'll understand as we go through the discussion that the amount of frequency at which the probe operates is very important in terms of the image acquisition. The linear probes have a footprint of about 25 millimeters, okay? And, but they work at a very, very high frequency between 6 and 13 megahertz. The phased array and curvilinear probes uh, have uh, um, larger footprints, but they tend to work at lower frequencies. The curvilinear works usually closer to this 2 megahertz uh, number and the phased array closer to the 5. The important part of the transducer is really this part right here. The rest of this is just for your hand and, and connecting the cables. The real meat of this, of this probe is right here at the, at the very uh, front of the probe. And if you expand this and dissect it, this is basically what you have. You have about four or five layers. Uh, the most important layer being that of the crystals, which is here. This, these piezoelectric crystals are what takes the electrical energy provided by the machine and converts it into an ultrasound wave. It's also the layer that receives the ultrasound waves and converts it back into electricity. These are extremely fragile. They break very easily. I have to always chuckle to myself when I ask the resident or the fellow, go get the ultrasound machine, and they wheel it around the corner, and there are two probes dangling on the floor and banging on the floor as they wheel it around the corner. Well, you, you destroy these very, very easily, and they're very expensive. Uh, I think one of the machines that we're using up in the medical ICU now actually uh, probably needs to be replaced, one of the probes, because we're already getting a lot of um, uh, artifact um, probably from damaging of uh, these crystals. There was an older technology, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, linear beam versus what we have now on the newer machines is uh, multi-beam uh, firing. That is that the rays, the ultrasound waves, go out at an angle as opposed to very, very linear fashion. The reason for this is that you get echoes back that um, uh, reduce artifacts and actually increase your detail. Again, I don't think you'll ever, I, I think most machines now are, are come with this as standard. You probably will not see this and I wouldn't worry myself too much about it. One of the concepts that took me a while to really understand is, like a CT scanner, what you're really looking at when you're looking at an ultrasound image is a tomographic slice. Even though that footprint may be 25 millimeters or uh, 60 millimeters, that is the contact surface over which you can put it on the patient. You have to have some of that 60 millimeters or 25 millimeters actually in contact with the patient. But the actual beam that comes out is a, pretty much the thickness of a credit card, okay, and about a millimeter in diameter. And so this, if you, you need to angle it exactly to get the slice uh, that you want, and those are the echoes that will come back. Probably one of the biggest mistakes that I see with our fellows is inappropriate or incorrect um, holding of the transducer. Uh, if you'll notice, if, if you work in these workshops that we're talking about, uh, you'll notice that all the probes have what's called an indicator or orientation mark, uh, or usually it's a little notch that's on the probe. This corresponds to when your image is displayed on a screen, uh, a little indicator mark or dot on the screen. So if I'm holding the probe on the patient such that the indicator mark is pointing toward their head, then when I'm looking at the screen and that mark is there, that indicates that this is toward the patient's head. Now you may say, well, I can easily tell that. Well, you may, it may not be so easy. As you get moving that probe around and, and, and searching with it, you can get disoriented pretty, pretty easily. So keeping your orientation is a very, very important part. I saw 
Uh, in my former job at Ohio State, I saw a, a fellow um, going after a pleural effusion with ultrasound machine, and they got confused of whether they were above or below the diaphragm, and somebody had to jump in and grab them before they introduced the, the needle uh, into the abdominal uh, cavity rather than into the, uh, into the chest cavity. So uh, you can get uh, disoriented pretty easily, but always remember that the indicator mark here should correspond to the indicator mark on your screen. The exception, oh, by the way, uh, normally this always points toward the patient's head. There is one exception, that's with, when we're doing cardiac imaging. Uh, the American College of Cardiology has um, stated that the indi indicator mark should go on the right side because there's no way as you're doing the cardiac images that the indicator mark can always be pointing at the patient's head. So by convention, when you're doing cardiac imaging, the uh, American College of Cardiology has you put the indicator mark over here. And again, this would be more clear. I can't really explain this. It's kind of hard to talk through this, but if you take some of the courses with us, you will, you will see what I'm talking about. So let's review how sound travels. Now most of you, all of you, I'm sure, have taken physics before and you recognize that, uh, that electromagnetic waves like light or heat uh, radiate in what we call a transverse wave, where the, the distance between two crests is a wavelength or the difference between two uh, troughs is a wavelength. But sound doesn't travel that way, as you recall. Sound travels as what's called a compression wave, where you have, instead of peaks, you have areas of compressed uh, uh, material that the wave is moving through, what we call the compression, and then what would normally correspond to a trough or areas of uh, fewer density that we call the rarefaction. Okay? Now, despite this, we tend to still, as we talk about ultrasound, we'll tend to still demonstrate it in the fashion of a transverse wave, but just so that you understand, um, and you remember from your high school physics that sound travels in a compression wave and not as a transverse wave, even though we'll display it a lot for the simplicity of imaging uh, to show it like this. Regardless, the, the, the velocity at which a sound wave travels is dependent upon the density of the material through which it's traveling. Um, are there any scuba divers in the room? No, I scuba dive. One of the things they teach you when you scuba dive is that under underwater sound travels so much faster, uh, and the, and with that. So if if I'm 60 feet underwater and I hear a boat, I hear the motor of a boat. I can't tell if that boat's right above me, or I can, or if it's a mile away, because the sound's traveling so fast it sounds like it's right on top of me. Okay. Actually, air is the worst conductor of sound waves. In air. Um, sound usually moves about 330 meters per second. That's the speed of sound in air. When we're ultrasounding a person or a patient, then um, the usual conduction of sound through uh, calcified material such as bone is about 4,000 meters per second. Through liquids and, uh, such as tissue, fat, and muscle, about 1,500 meters per second. And through air, as I've already mentioned, 330 meters per second. The ultrasound machine is calibrated to preferentially display images from materials that are reflecting echoes in the range of this 1,500 meters per second. So consequently, these are the kinds of materials that you're going to see on echo, um, uh, uh, excuse me, ultrasound examinations. These materials, bone and air, will usually give you what we call artifacts, and I'm going to discuss artifacts a little bit more in the lecture. Anytime you put an ultrasound wave into a patient, you can have a weakening of the beam, which we call attenuation. And just like light, ultrasound waves or sound waves will reflect off of a medium. Again, that's what we depend upon. We depend on the reflection to come back to get our images. But some of the ultrasound waves you're going to put in are going to scatter in multiple directions. You won't be able to get those waves back for interpretation. Some of them are going to bend around materials that have different densities. Just like light bends through a prism, sound waves will bend around two materials that have different density that are in are juxtaposition to one another. And then some of it's going to be actually absorbed and converted to heat. Fortunately, that's a very, very small uh, percentage. When they started doing ultrasounds of, the, and believe they do this, they actually will ultrasound the globe of the eye. There were con concerns early on that you might heat up the, the globe and cause damage. That turned out not to be the case, but that was one of the early considerations for that. 
The ability how deep through the tissue that you can get with the ultrasound is, is based mostly on the frequency. Lower frequencies are needed to image deep structures. Higher frequencies are uh, better for imaging superficial structures. Uh, and also higher frequencies generally give you better image quality. So this goes back to the type of probe that we select. If I want to image somebody's uh, a liver, uh, and they have ascites and everything else, I'm probably not going to use that linear probe, which was the high-frequency probe, because it's only going to allow me to image a very, very short distance into the body. I'm not going to get good images of a liver using a vascular probe. We usually use that linear probe for looking at superficial vessels, like when we put lines in the, either the femoral or the, or the jugular uh, areas. The lower the frequency the longer the wavelength that was we've already discussed. So if you have a long wavelength, then it is not going to allow you, because the wavelength may actually go over to, um, let's say you're trying to image these two structures, and the, wa and the wavelength is very, very long. The returning echoes are, not, are going to be so long that they do not discriminate these two different images, and you're only going to see one image back. So that's why low uh, wavelength, low frequency, uh, doesn't, is not really good at giving you high image uh, uh, quality because it cannot discriminate between two structures that are close to one another. The higher frequency, that is the shorter wavelength, will actually be able to discriminate these two things because the sound waves are coming back such that you can uh, pick out that this is actually two structures. So the distance between two reflectors is longer than the wavelength, then both uh, reflectors will be displayed. That is, this shorter wavelength will be able to pick up two here instead of a long wavelength that would only pick up this is one entity. So this is why your image quality is better with the higher frequency. Here's an example. If you see here the, at the 5 megahertz frequency, this is a higher frequency than the two, you can actually see what we call here in the far field that the images get very, very dark and, and the, the quality here is very, very poor. Now we'll go through this a little bit later, but what you're looking at here is, uh, is a slice on, on, the, on the video display. And this is what we call the near field. This is where your probe is sitting. If I were putting this probe right over somebody's uh, abdomen, then this, these are the layers of skin and muscle that are immediately under the probe. And this is, goes further and further away from the probe. All right, so this is what we call the near field, and this is what we call the far field. Effects of frequency on image quality. Again, the higher frequencies, it, you know, I, I think this is actually a very poor slide on some of the site. I'm going to have to criticize them for that. But it's meant to, it probably doesn't project out there very well, but this is meant to display that this is the better image quality. I think it's clearly better than this one. I'm not so sure it's much better than that one. But basically, the take-home message is the higher frequency, the better the image quality. But the, the trade-off is the depth that you can penetrate into tissue is not as good. Okay, so one of the things about ultrasonography is that you want to be sure that the, the area that you're interested in, the, the image you're trying to capture, is displayed in the middle of the field. So in this, there's a button on the uh, console that allows you to regulate the depth, and the depth is usually, or always, uh, over here in marked in centimeters. So actually, even though I may be using a, uh, a certain type of probe, I can toggle it so that it's, it, I can get images from deeper and deeper, but again, if I'm using the wrong probe, I may get some images that are deeper, but they're not going to be very good quality images. Okay. So here the image is too shallow. If I'm trying to, uh, to uh, image this vascular structure, this I'm, I've got the machine set too deep because I don't need to see this. Notice that the quality is much better here than it is here in the far field. This is because we're using a high-frequency probe, so the images that come back here in the far field are not very good. This is exactly what you want. You want to adjust the depth of the display so that the area that you're trying to focus uh, or trying to image is in the middle of the screen. Effective depth on attenuation. Again, the deeper that you go, the more beam weakening that you're going to get. So again, with this structure here, you want to keep this in the middle. You want to use the proper probe. You want to use the proper depth so that you have good quality images all the way from the near field to the far field. All right, how do we, are there any questions on 
the actual physics of, of, of imaging before we talk about how to describe these images. Because if you're going to, just like reading an EKG, you got to talk the lingo, okay? If uh, you got to know what, a, when you're talking to one of your colleagues, you talk about the, the PR interval, the QRS interval, or whatever. So you got to know the lingo. So that's what we're going to talk about next is, is the actual describing of ultrasound images. But are there any questions on the actual ultrasound physics, the actual physics of the wave? Okay. So terminology and orientation. I've already been through a little bit of this. If this is your, your display screen, uh, again, the centimeters of depth are outlined over here. And right now this is set at 15 centimeters of depth. You have your indicator mark on the left side, and that corresponds to, again to your pro, the, the mark on your probe. We call this the near field. That is, everything that's displayed here um, is closest to the probe. Everything that is farther down here is farthest from your probe. And we call this side, where the indicator mark is, the leading edge, or it's the edge that's toward the indicator mark, and this back here is what's called the receding edge. Okay. So if I have this image here, which is of a liver, um, and here's the diaphragm, and these are intra-abdominal structures, the kidney is here, I know that this is toward the, the leading edge of my image is toward the patient's head. Because by convention, I have the indicator mark there, which means the indicator mark on the probe is pointing toward the patient's head. And I will encourage you to use the terms uh, cephalad when you're talking about going toward the head and caudad when referring to this way. Again, it can get very, very confusing if you start saying up, down, left, right, uh, anterior, posterior, ventral, dorsal, it can get very, very confusing when you're trying to describe these images. So I would encourage you to use this terminology. Echo brightness equals gain. Now, I know everybody in this room is too young to remember black and white televisions. Okay? I understand that. I, I grew up watching a black and white television, and one of the things we would routinely have to do to to make sure that the image was as good as possible, there was a button called a gain. Okay, and you would actually have to rotate this button to make it brighter. And that's basically what the gain button does. It is it uh, it enhances the echoes to display them more brilliantly on your screen. Uh, I'm the person, one of the people I took ultrasound course from. Uh, likened it to their daughter's stereo. You know, if she wanted to hear it louder, crank it up. Okay? So basically what you want to do here is that you want to use the gain button, and there are three of them actually on your console. This is for the near field, this is for the far field, and this is the total gain. Most people just manipulate the total gain button. So this is too dim, this is too bright, this one's probably the best image, and you can adjust that on the console. When we talk about describe, when we describe structures on echo, this is some of the, the, the terminology we use. We use hypoechoic. That means this, this structure here, this round spherical structure is less echogenic than the surrounding tissue. It is sending back fewer echoes, so it tends to look darker on the screen. We don't say dark, we don't say light, we don't say white, we don't say black. We say this is hypoechoic. Alternatively, this one's hyperechoic. That means it's sending back more echoes. If you do uh, focused cardiac imaging, a lot of times the um, uh, pleural surfaces or the pericardial surfaces are very, just because of the nature of their their uh, their structure, they're, they tend to be very hyperechoic. So they display on the screen very, very brightly. Okay. So depending on the tissue that you're seeing, it's going to look um, uh, differently in terms of hypoechoic and hyperechoic. Some structures don't send back any echoes. Okay, they are anechoic. Anybody have an example of what would be an anechoic structure? Yeah, anything that's fluid filled, a blood vessel, somebody said, or a cyst. Because as we've already talked about, ultrasound waves go through those materials much, much faster and they're, con uh, they're con um, uh, convected through those and they don't send back many echoes. So consequently, this does not send back echoes. It displays as very, very dark, or we call it anechoic. Notice that the structures behind it, however, tend to be brighter 
They're more hyperechoic than the other structures. Why is that? That's because as the ultrasound beam comes through this and traverses this very, very quickly, then the material behind it has the ability then to reflect more echoes because all these were being transmitted through. So this displays slightly hyperechoic. This is an example of an artifact that will help you identify things. So let's say this was not a blood vessel. Let's say this was a cyst, and the ultrasonographer sees that it's hyperechoic distal or beyond or below. Again, this is where your terminology becomes important. Uh, behind this cystic structure, then you can be confident that this is a fluid-filled structure and that most likely assists because the artifact behind it is very hyperechoic. So this is how one way how artifacts can um, can help you. And then isoechoic, that is you can't see, you can't discriminate this structure from anything around. It has the same echogenicity as the surrounding tissue. So artifacts, I've been kind of leading into this. They have good, the bad, and the ugly. And again, just like any ultrasound wave, uh, there's reflection, scatter, refraction, and absorption. But the artifacts are caused by several factors, uh, such as these, as the sound travels through the body. Artifacts can help you confirm structures, as I just pointed out. Uh, uh, understanding uh, the lung, uh, the bowel, um, and free air in the abdomen. Gallstones will produce an artifact that we call shadowing. And cysts, as I just showed you, will show enhancements distal to the cyst that, again, makes you think, oh, this is a fluid-filled structure, and this is most likely a cystic uh, structure. We have some examples here. Remember that the speed of sound is dependent upon the medium in which the sound is traveling. Uh, since the ultrasound machine is calibrated only to display returning echoes moving at that Set speed of fifth, around 1,500 meters per second, the echoes reflected by bone and gas and those sort of um, materials will not display in the same way. Thus, an artifact will always result from those types of echoes, when re uh, those types of returning echoes, like from gas and things that don't travel in this uh, uh, velocity range. So, here's an example. I, I don't know how well this projects out into, I see Jacqueline sitting out there. I know she has a lot of experience uh, with this as well. Jacqueline, for those of you who don't know, is also helping us uh, with uh, some of our training. Um, just to, again, just to kind of go back for a moment, as this has become more and more popular in training programs for critical care, it's actually filtered down. Some places routinely tre uh, um, uh, train their house staff to do this. Others have already moved it to the medical school level, okay? So I know where I came from at Ohio State that this is part of the fourth-year curriculum. Also part of gross anatomy uh, is now teaching ultrasound, okay? So uh, Jacqueline, uh, Wayne, State? Wayne State? Wayne State. So they teach it there, and Jacqueline's been very helpful in doing uh, helping us with our, our uh, sessions so far. So um, I, don't, yeah, I don't know how well this uh, displays out there, but here you have uh, a... Uh, liver, diaphragm, kidney, and notice that this anechoic or hypoechoic strip right there, what do you think may be causing that? What is that? That is an artifact. There are obviously no echoes or very few echoes coming back from that region. So what may be causing that artifact? Actually, it's a rib shadow. Remember, you have some ribs that actually go down over over the uh, over the liver, so this is actually a shadow of a rib. So the ultrasound wave does not display those echoes that are coming back very very well from this region because it's behind the rib. What about here? This one's a little tougher. We have a kidney, and then we have all of this hypoechoic or anechoic region, and everything in front of that is very very hyperechoic. So what might this, this what might this be? Anybody have any idea? It's a hint that you're already in the abdomen. This is bowel gas. Okay, so this is actually again because the the um, ultrasound wave does not travel well through the air, you get a lot of scatter from this. So a lot of beams are coming back, but every but a lot is not passing through very easily. So everything behind it does not display. So this is from bowel gas. So useful artifacts. When sound encounters high attenuating tissue, echoes are diminished posteriorly, causing what we call acoustic shadowing. And you can see that from gallstones. You can see that from bone spurs uh, and other normal anatomic structures, such as the spine.
And I've already shown you an example of this one. When sound encounters low attenuating tissue, such as fluid, the echoes are enhanced posteriorly. Again, so what, if this is my near field, my probe's up here sending ultrasound beams in this direction, and they're going through this material and enhancing the material posteriorly, what is this most likely to be? A fluid-filled structure, most likely because of the contour is very abnormal. This is a cyst. Okay? So, again, this is an example where the artifact being immediately posterior or below where the ultrasound beam waves are coming actually helps you interpret that as a fluid-filled structure, in this case, likely a cyst. Let's talk about some of the imaging modes. 2D is a very, very common one. That's the one we we're most going to use in the ICU. Echoes are displayed as dots. The stronger the returning echo, the higher the amplitude, the brighter the dot on the screen. You select the modes, whether you're talking about 2D, M mode, or uh, pulse wave Doppler over here on the right. Uh, this is a cardiac image, okay? Two-dimensional image. It's that tomographic slice. This is what we call the M mode, where the 2D image shows the tomographic slice. Okay, so here you've got, uh, this is uh, Ceph Lab in this direction on this image because my indicator marks up here. So this is Ceph Lab, okay, and this is toward the uh, the near field, so this is toward the patient's sternum, okay? So I have a two-dimensional, don't have a three-dimensional image like a, uh, like a CT scan, but I have a two-dimensional image here. But then in this view, what we have here is what's called M-mode, where it's like, it, the analogy would be putting an ice pick straight through the structures here of the heart. It, it, you can see here, this is the right atrium, the aortic outflow track through the mitral valve, and now what you're displaying is one dimension, in this case, depth, related to time. So again, this is not a video, and I apologize I don't have this as a video, but if I were doing this with a video, you would actually see these moving as part of the, the cardiac cycle going on. So in this way, I'm looking at one dimension, in this case depth, versus time. And this is what we do with what we call the end mode. Everybody in here knows what the Doppler effect is. I don't really don't need to go through this. For those of you who are a little more algebraically inclined, uh, there's the formula, in case you're interested. We all know as the ambulance moves toward us, or the train moves toward us, the pitch is higher, uh, and because the sound waves are getting pushed closer and closer together, as the source recedes from us, the sound waves get pulled out, the wavelength gets longer, the pitch tends to drop. So we use that principle in ultrasonography, but instead of the pitch in, that we hear up and down, we assign colors to that pitch change, okay? So this is results in what we call color Doppler echo. The pixels are assigned a color based on the, the velocity, that is, if, that, if it's moving away from us or moving toward us, then the velocity is different, and it displays the direction of the flow. It is a qualitative assay, not a quantitative assay. So I can only see if something is moving toward me or away from me. I can't tell how much, okay? Color Doppler is what we call angle dependent, and I have an example of that coming up. Uh, therefore, there is, if you're holding the transducer perpendicular to a vascular structure, you're not going to get many echoes returning, okay? So you're not going to have any color. However, remember the term BART, B-A-R-T. If you have ultra, if, if, if you see blue on a pulse, on a, a color Doppler echo, then that uh, fluid that you're imaging is moving away from you, okay? If you see red, it is moving toward you. And again, that was just assigned by convention. Um, if any of you like astronomy and you're familiar with redshift and uh, of, of, of galaxies and things moving away, it's, I, they, they, they did the colors just the opposite way. So uh, you can forget about it if astronomy is one of your, your hobbies and remember this if you're going to use the ultrasound. So blue means away, red means toward. The color scale is another important factor in determining the quality of those um, moving reflections. So here's an example of what I was talking about. In this example, you have blood moving in this vessel in this direction. The ultrasound probe is sending out a beam that is perfectly perpendicular. This is going to be your display in your vessel. There's hardly any color there at all because the probe has to be angled toward or relative to the movement of the fluid, the blood, in the vessel to get any returning echoes. So in this example, I have angled the probe this way, and if blood's flowing this way, then blood is moving toward, okay, 
my ultrasound beam and it's going to display more as red. Again, BART. Blue would be away, red is toward. So the blood in this vessel is moving toward my ultrasound beam. The ultrasound beam is coming down, reflecting off these moving corpuscles coming in this direction, coming back and being displayed as red. Everybody got that? Pretty simple. Those of you, how many people have actually put in central lines using ultrasound? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. So most of you do this, but how many of you use the color function on the echo? Uh, I mean, a lot of you probably just see a dark uh, or anechoic hole, and you say, that's the vessel, okay, and I put the needle there. But how many actually use the, the color? Okay, so Jacqueline does. They've got another hand up here. All right. So that, that sometimes can help you make sure that it's, it's fluid moving in a column uh, that, uh, that you're going to, before you put that needle in. So here, here's a pop quiz for you. Here's a vascular structure. I put on the color frame here, and I've got the probe such that I'm seeing blood move through this, and the blood is blue. Is the flow in this image toward the transducer or away from the transducer? Sorry? It's away, right? Blue is away. <coughs> so, therefore, is this vessel an artery or a vein? Sorry? Can't tell, all right? It doesn't matter if it's artery or vein, all right? It only matters how you have the probe oriented toward the direction of flow. So don't make the mistake, and I've seen people do this. They say, oh, it's blue. It must be a vein. Well, no, it just depends on how you have that probe. I can sit at the top uh, in the ICU. I can put the probe on your jugular vein. If I've got an image one way, it'll look blue, and I, if I turn the probe and image it another way, it'll look red, all right? The same structure. It has nothing to do whether it's artery or vein. It has to do with the orientation of the probe relative to the direction of blood flow. Pulse wave Doppler. Now, where color Doppler was qualitative only, not quantitative, pulse wave Doppler is actually a way of looking at the speed of blood cells displayed on a uh, time graph. So, like your M mode I showed you before, by using pulse wave Doppler, you can actually measure the velocity of blood. One of uh, our fellows, senior fellows, Patton Thompson, is currently actually doing his research project with this and correlating pulse wave Doppler echoes in carotid arteries based with the hemodynamic status uh, of the patient, uh, uh, whether they have a pulmonary artery catheter in or a vigileo, and looking at cardiac output and relating it to pulse wave Doppler images. Again, we're not pushing sonocyte, but this is the system that we're using up here in our ICU. Most of you have probably used that. It's actually very, very simple. Everything up here is a display screen. Here at the bottom, you, you select the modes, whether it's 2D, M mode, pulse wave, all here. This toggle switch here helps you decide the depth that you want to display on the screen, up or down. Your gain button, how loud your stereo is, okay, is right here. Um, and then you've got a touchpad for actually recording images if you want to do that. Very simple once you learn the layout of the machine. So, let me summarize. Knowledge of ultrasound physics needs, uh, is needed for, to optimize your image. You have to understand how to choose the appropriate probe for the, Im for the, the examination you're going to do. You have to get the gain settings right that are going to give you the optimum uh, quality. The depth settings have to be correct. You have to understand the characteristics of the tissue that the ultrasound wave is going through and bouncing back. And also you have to be aware of the artifacts. All of these things, understanding all of these things, will make you a better ultrasonographer. So as I, I conclude this talk, really with, when I did I talk to our fellows, this is, again, this is just an introduction. Let's boldly go to the next step which for our critical care trainees is actually going to be doing uh, uh, periodic review of video clips, understanding pathology, actually going to the simulation lab uh, and doing a scanning of live models, which I think I've done with some of you in this room. We're going to continue that for you guys as well as our fellows. And then ultimately our ICU rounds, which are going to commence next month, where we're going to actually go into the unit and have patients volunteer uh, to be scanned uh, and looking for you know pathology. 
So that's how we've got our course outlined to enhance our educational experience. Again, this is not happening just with us, but this is picking up all across the country. And if any of you are contemplating a, uh, um, a career in hosp- as a hospitalist, this will be important to you. If you're uh, contemplating a career in uh, critical care medicine, this will become important to you. Obviously, if you're a cardiologist, you're going to learn to do this uh, with cardiac echoes, but in ICU, we're doing other things other than just cardiac. 